Welcome to Spine Academy. In this surgical technique video, we're going to review my technique for placing C3 to 6 lateral mass fixation. These screws are a valuable adjuvant in surgeries like a posterior cervical decompression infusion and many other procedures. Efficiency in these procedures really requires having a really good workflow that you've rehearsed and kind of gone through. In this video, we're going to talk about the landmarks and anatomy that's relevant to placement of subaxial lateral mass screws, and we're going to go over my workflow or technique for placing them. So let's dive now into placement of C3 to 6 lateral mass screws and talk a little bit about the relevant anatomy for that. So if you look at this animation, you can see here how the spine looks from the front. And as it rotates, you can see as you wrap around C1 and 2 at the top, C3 to 7 down below. This is looking at it from the back, of course, looking at the spinous processes. And here, when you look at it from the side, you can again see the front of the spine, the discs themselves. These are these foramina that the nerves come out of. You can see the vertebral artery to the side of the spine on each side. And then this structure right here is called the lateral mass. It has a very unusual shape in that it looks like a parallelogram from the side. So if you were to just draw a parallelogram around one structure, in this case, the C5 lateral mass, you can see that its shape is very much a parallelogram in three dimensions, or what we call a parallelopiped. If you were to continue to spin this image around and look at it just from the back, you could see here's the spinous processes, here's the lamina, and this structure right there is the lateral mass, just to the side of the spinal canal. So you can see here how it's a paired structure. Again, you have lateral masses, a stack of them on one side from three all the way down to seven, and a lateral mass stack on the other side from three all the way down to seven. Now, from the back, this structure looks roughly rectangular. We approximate it to say it looks like a rectangle. And you can see again, each of these is rectangular with the medial border being dictated by the lamina. It's the junction of the lamina and this lateral mass. And the lateral border is a well-defined kind of lateral boundary to the structure itself. And then up and down, so cranially, you can see that there's a structure right here, the top of it, of the superior regular process, right at that joint, and the joint below forms the floor below it. So that is the boundaries of this rectangle when you're looking at it from the back. Now, if you were to take the center of those rectangles, you get start points that look like this. I usually start lateral mass screws right at the center of each of those lateral masses. So if you were to imagine drawing a diagonal or splitting it from top to bottom and from medial to lateral, you want to kind of identify that start point as the start point of your lateral mass screw. In general, I pay particular attention to getting these to line up. I don't want them to be all jagged where the screws won't necessarily line up properly. So I make these start points collinearly and over my years of practice, I've actually gone to incorporating a specific step where I just make the start points and I just identify start points on both sides so I know at the end of it that the tulips are gonna line up and the rods will be easy to seat. So that's a bit of a technique thing that I do that not everybody always does. So here's the start points when you look at them from the back. You can see again, it's the center of those. And then if you were to roll from the side, typically the start points would be right in the middle. So you would start right at the midpoint here. You can see screws fly in that show kind of from top to bottom at the C3 level. Your start point is going to be more or less at the midpoint of that lateral mass. Now, these screws tend to follow the articular surface, so they go up with that parallelogram. So in general, these screws are directed from low to high. You're kind of cranializing them quite a bit. And then you'll see in another view that you're lateralizing it a little bit, and we'll talk about why we do that. But this kind of gives you a sense when you look at it from the side that you really want the screw to be parallel to the articular surfaces of all of these joints. And so each of these screws is gonna go in like that. And you can see as you advance these screws in, they kind of follow that. If you really pay close attention, it's interesting that these screws do not seat completely because the tulip hits the lateral mass on the bottom. And so if you put a 14 millimeter screw and you're really only gonna get 11 or 12 millimeters of purchase because the screw or the tulip ends up being a little bit proud. So think about that when you're planning your screw lengths. Now, if you were to rotate this image and see the screws from the back, this again highlights the fact that these screws go from medial 
to lateral. So if you think about the trajectory of this screw, it's directed cranially towards the head and laterally away from the midline to avoid some important structures. In this case, when you look at it all the way around, if you look at the same picture, kind of look at it in, along the, the, the course of the vertebral body, you can kind of see that the screw goes lateral to avoid the vertebral artery. So that's why your start point is in the midpoint, again, from medial to lateral of the lateral mass. If you were to look straight ahead of you, that's where the vert is. So again, this is why you direct the screw laterally, and you'll see this on both sides. And then you direct it rostrally to avoid the nerve that runs out in this saddle and so-called foramen here. Uh, and that is why these screws, when they're put in, go from medial to lateral and from low to high. This is an important technique to learn, and we'll look at it in greater detail in a cadaver model. So let's start now with identifying appropriate landmarks that you're looking for when you're doing this dissection. As I said before, if you look at this image from a posterior approach, this is looking at the cervical spine, the C3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 levels, those are the levels where you can really consider putting in lateral mass screws. So again, the boundaries of the lateral mass, here's the bottom, here's the top of this one. You can see this rectangle right there. The start points that I generally use are the midpoints of the lateral mass, and midpoints in both dimensions, from medial to lateral and from cranial to caudal, those are the start points that I use. Now, it is important to note, if you read about lateral mass fixation, there are a variety of different trajectories that you can use to put screws into this fairly small structure. The most notable ones are really, or most popular ones, really the magral or modified magral trajectory, which is really what I'm going to show today. Although Roy Camille techniques are established, I just don't use them because their trajectory jeopardizes the vertebral artery a little bit uh, more than I would like. This could be considered really a modified magral trajectory because I take the midpoint, but rather than deviating it medially a millimeter and rostrally a millimeter, or medially and caudally a millimeter, which has been described, I think that it's very hard with a three millimeter bit and a three and a half millimeter screw to really intentionally only get one millimeter away. So I find when you say, let me go a little medial and a little caudal, that you end up going two or three millimeters medial and two or three millimeters caudal. So I generally target the midpoint and then bias everything a little bit inferiorly and a little bit medially, and I'll talk about how I do that. So these are the appropriate start points. You can see that not only are they all kind of roughly at the midpoint of the lateral mass, each one respectively, but that also these screws line up. And I make it a point to kind of make all of these start points. So here, if you're looking at a cadaver model, once again, looking at the back of the cervical spine, here you can see I've already put in C2 and C1 screws. That's not really germane for this cadaver uh, discussion. But you can see, again, midline is right here. And as you look at these structures, again, I'm using with the bovi, just defining these structures. You can see here the lateral aspect of the lateral mass. That's a well-defined structure. The top and bottom, so if you look on this side, here's the top, here's the bottom, here's the lateral border, those are well defined. The one that I think can be a little bit ambiguous is this line right here between the lateral aspect of the lamina and the medial aspect of the uh, lateral mass. That landmark is a little bit tricky to identify, but I will very deliberately, once I have done my dissection, each of these lines I'll define with a bovi. If I need to, I'll take a Lexel Ranger and remove any osteophytic disease to really be sure that you can see those structures. And on, you know, not infrequently, I will actually take a coker and actually manipulate the level to be sure that I'm really looking at the articulation between levels so I know where the top and bottom of each lateral mass is. So now once those are established, I will come in with a burr. And as I said, I will actually identify the start points very clearly with a high-speed burr. So here you can see I'm looking at each of the boundaries, the medial and lateral, and making a start point that I think looks good. That start point I will make with either a 1.7 millimeter bit like you see here, or a three millimeter matchstick bit. And that's something that I look at very clearly, make sure I, first of all, am at a satisfactory start point for each of the lateral masses, but also that these line up. And you can see here, how these screws would line up. The pilot holes line up pretty nicely. It even lines up, since we have these screws, you can see how they can be lined up pretty cleanly all the way down. And you can even line them up to the thoracic spine as well. So I will typically make these start points very deliberately, but the landmarks to focus on are really gonna be the boundaries of the lateral mass, uh, where each of these is at the midpoint of the lateral mass. So those are the relevant structures in terms of understanding local landmarks.
So generally when we're putting in lateral mass screws, we're putting in a number of them. Uh, so in this case, we'd, for example, if you look at this image, bring in C3 to six lateral mass screws on both sides, that's eight screws. So from a sequencing standpoint, I tend to do the maneuvers. I'll make start points for all of them, then pilot holes for all of them, then tap them all, then put screws in. Unlike thoracolumbar lumbar screws where you might make a pilot hole and then tap it and put a screw and then go to the next one. So that is an important thing to think about from a sequencing standpoint. Now, if you look at this image again, we have start points. We've already created eight start points that are again at the midpoint of the lateral masses. And it's time now to put pilot holes in for the lateral mass screws themselves. So one of the things that I like to teach when I'm doing this is, you know, the correct technique for drilling a pilot hole, there's some nuance to it. So if you imagine having a surface, for example, like a wall that you wanna put a, a, a pilot hole in, if you were to come into this with a drill and the drill is roughly cylindrical, and let's say this is the helix of your drill here, and you wanna make a pilot hole, this will pretty readily give you a pilot hole that looks like this, right? Now, if you come in at an angle though, and imagine you're bringing in a drill at an angle like that. It goes all the way to the surface here. So let's say it looks like this on the surface. It really preferentially makes contact right here. So the bottom edge of that drill will make contact and the bigger your bit is, so for example, if you have a bit like this, will preferentially make contact there. When you power that drill, it's important two things. One of them, that it's full speed. You don't necessarily want to put on light speed. People tend to think that's more delicate. These are cutting bits, so you want full speed on these to maximize the torque and the cutting effect of the bit itself. You also have to be sensitive to the fact that if you're making contact here, this bit is going to skip roster. It'll skip towards the top here, right? This is going to start spitting out here because it'll be making contact there and spitting towards the ceiling or toward, you know, up in this direction. Now, because of that, if you really want to make a start point with a bit like this, you have to apply pressure downwards to kind of engage that surface. So why am I mentioning all this stuff? If you look at, again, this picture here, and you look at just this structure right here, here's the lateral mass. We're going to be making contact here at the bottom of it, right there. That is the part that's going to be making contact when we apply our drill, if the drill has dimension. So having said all of that, when I use these drills, I will typically start with a drill that looks like this, if I'm using a drill with the drill guide. And I might, for example, have it, as you can see here, I'll have the drill in place there. I will start with the guide all the way back, and that's so that I can apply downwards and medial force on the bit, and I can cannulate that lateral mass. And this will show you kind of the trajectory that you get from that. So what's the teaching point here? The teaching point is that if you're using a drill bit with dimension, like a three millimeter drill bit to make a pilot hole, know that if you just go down with the drill bit and put the guide all the way down, that when you pull the trigger, that bit is going to preferentially skip laterally and rostrally and not be exactly where you want the start point to be. So keep the drill guide back, and when you're applying pressure, apply pressure medially and caudally to make sure that you're starting the start point that you really want. That is the point when you're using a drill like that. Now, there's another way of putting in pilot holes, and that is to use a 1.7 millimeter drill bit, which if you saw the C1 or the C2 uh, lateral mass or PARS screw videos, you will have seen me use this bit. This is a very nice way to cannulate the lateral mass also, but because it is a small bit, more akin to this picture here, it doesn't skip quite as much. So for example, if you see how I actually cannulate with this, you make a start point, and then once you're happy with the start point, you can pretty comfortably direct it laterally and rostrally to make your start point, and this gives you a sense that you can really direct it quite rostrally. I'll tend to make it whatever technique I use. I will typically not use some drill and some um, high-speed burr with a 1.7 bit, I usually do it the same technique. Which technique depends a little bit on the case and what the architecture looks like. Generally, if I'm teaching or working with a resident or a fellow and I wanna really monitor what they're doing from a trajectory standpoint, I think that the, uh, the, the striker hand drill or power drill with a, with a guide on it tends to work a little bit better. It helps, to, helps me know what trajectory they're really using. But it's dealer's choice in terms of how to create the pilot holes. Now, once those pilot holes are complete, I'll check all of the pilot holes with the ball tip probe. Once I'm happy that I've got good uh, bottoms at each of them, then I'll bring in a tap, as you can see here, 
and I will tap each of those pilot holes. And again, I'm tapping all eight of them. So I'll run four on my side, and my assistant will run four on the other side. You usually work contralaterally with this procedure. So you start, I will put in, if I'm sitting on this side, I will put screws in on the other side, and vice versa. It's possible, of course, to do the opposite, but I don't typically use flora, but this is just to exemplify where the trajectory is when you use a tap, for example, and you're kind of directing it rosterly as you are here. So I will typically use a tap. I will tap all, of, all eight of these holes. Then I'll come back in with a ball tip probe. And once the ball tip probe is uh, verified to make sure that I have floors at every level, then I'll come in with a screw and start putting all of my screws in. Now the tap that I use, it's important that if you use a 1.7 millimeter drill bit, the hole you have is very small, typically with chatter about a two millimeter pilot hole. So the tap that I use is very much like this type of a tap that you see here, which is a Christmas tree conical tap that helps expand the hole to accept a 3.5 millimeter screw. Then once all of these are tapped, then I'll come in with the ball to probe again, make sure I have a floor. You can see each of these has a floor from the way that the body itself is working. And then if there's anything that I need to adjust, I'll adjust it and then I come in with the screws. And the screws are usually 14 millimeters. I would say that is probably 80%, 90% of the screws that I use are 14 millimeter length, 3.5 millimeter diameter. And again, I am not looking to bury this screw because it's directed obliquely. So the top of the screw, for example, if this is the tulip over here, as I advance this, the tulip will make contact here and part of the shank will be exposed once it's all the way in. So it will not be buried all the way when I put these screws in because of the contact there. Now, because it's polyaxial, it'll kind of kick its way back up again, but that is important as you're putting it down, it'll feel like you have more distance. Feel for the insertional torque. Once you feel engagement, like the tulip is making contact with the bone, then I'll stop and I'll go to the next screw. So I will tend to put all eight of my screws in like this, where I'll start at the top and work my way down. One important thing that I will do is that right towards the end, here you can see, for example, I put in three and I put in four. Now, the natural inclination is to think the next screw going in is five. I tend to make a point of putting in the next screw after three and four that I put in will be the screw that is most likely to break out. So if I was going to seven, I would put seven in. And the reason for that is interesting. If you put a screw in, for example, at six, and six breaks out, you can still use that screw at five and put in a seven pedicle screw. If you were to put it in and it's secure, you can just take another screw and put it in at five. It saves you a screw, so you're not wasting a screw, which inevitably, if you work from top down, you can get stuck with a broken lateral mass at the bottom with a wasted screw. And it's a nuance, admittedly, but it's still like a nice little trick. So I'll put in three, four, six, five. That's the sequence in which I put screws in when I'm putting these in. And I'll do the same thing on both sides, as I indicated before. Usually I'll run all four and then run the other four, but if you have a very able assistant, you can alternate and put three, three, four, four, and go all the way down. That just requires a bit of workflow. But these are incredibly powerful, incredibly fast screws to put in where you can insert instrument four levels in the span of 20 minutes. And this is something that kind of, based on the workflow, you can really find a good technique for accomplishing that very quickly. Now, once all of these screws have gone in, here you can see, because I'm doing it in a cadaver setting and I'm putting it in myself, once all of these screws are in, I usually will check an x-ray. You can see how I did the same thing, three, four, then put six, then I put five in afterwards. It's the last screw I put in, check an x-ray. This gives you a sense that the screws themselves all line up beautifully. Everything is parallel to the surface of the articular surface themselves or to the lateral mass themselves. And I'm happy with the way that this looks. So this is how I put in screws from C3 to six that are subaxial lateral mass screws. So in this video, we covered the surgical technique for placement of subaxial lateral mass screws. Typically, these are done from C3 to 6, can be done at C7 as well. It's a workhorse technique, but as you saw in this video, hopefully, fairly efficient if you have a good workflow. So I hope to share my technique for doing it, and I hope that you found that valuable. I look forward to seeing you in future Spine Academy videos to come. <laughs>